Hi, everyone. Welcome to the April edition of The Clear View. I'm Lee Kessler, and most of you know me, but I realize there are some new people uh, watching maybe for the first time tonight. So I'm very happy that you all have joined me. Uh, glad to be with you as we're marching through spring here. And uh, just as a reminder to everybody, this site is specifically designed for common sense people who have a willingness to look and a real desire to know because there is so much information out there, but it doesn't always help us resolve the issues that we want resolved or guide us in a direction where we can put one foot in front of the other and actually produce the effect that we wanna produce in current events and current affairs in the United States and globally. So um, I, when I talk to you, always know that uh, you got a lot of common sense and that my job is to direct attention a little bit, but you've always been willing to look. And I trust that as you have reviewed material and continue to that's on the site, that um, your desire to know is bringing you to greater understanding. Now, just to orient everybody a little bit, we just finished a four month, four part series on how to train yourself to see what others missed. And uh, that's a skill set, but it can be developed. And I took four months of webcasts. So um, in case you, haven't watched them or haven't watched all of them yet, or you're new, you want to do them in order. The first one was called my January 6th story. And I do have a story on January 6th. And it is the found, it set a foundation for a lot of the work that we're doing here on the clear view, but it's not what you think it is. So you are going to watch uh, that episode. And uh, by the way, for those of you who are new, this is not a partisan political site at all. Uh, this commentary site and an insight site. Now, the second episode, which I believe is one of the most important webcasts that I've done during the time since I launched the Clearview, is called The Actor's Process. You're not going to want to miss that one. Now, you don't have to be an actor. You don't have to want to be an actor. You don't even have to like actors. But there's, I think many of you know, I am a long-term television and film actress and theater as well. But there is something in the actor's process, in the training that actors have, and learn to do if they'll do it, that enables us to see more and come in with different angles of view. It is the actor's process that broke loose the story that became the White King series, where I really cracked the case, if you will. Now, the third episode is look, don't listen. And of course, given that you're an audience that wants to do that, I think you'll probably really like that. And the fourth and final one, which uh, launched on March 1st, it's called Simple Trait, excuse me, Simple Truths, Simple Tools, and Simple Solutions. And uh, that one is very, very hopeful. Like my novels, you have to come through some difficult territory sometimes in order to get to the summit of the mountain range where you can see clearly and where there's calmness and hope. And uh, having come through those first three parts, which are very educational, I wanted the last one to just home in on some simple truths for every one of us and some simple tools that we can all use and that I used along the way, because that's the most common question I get asked to honest deeply, how on earth did you figure all this out? Well, it's in that series, but the simple solutions are there. And um, just like in Operation Stone Age Viral, which was the turning point in the novel, the final one in the White King series, White King and the Seat at the Table, and that's where the, um, the heroes and the American people fight back. And I'm speaking figuratively on that. But they find a way to stop the Great Reset in its tracks. And um, just like in that, as that solution unfolds in the novel, I hold that here on this site, that you are the solution, each and every one of you. And that if you're already engaged, awesome or if you want to engage but haven't figured out how or where, fine. Comes with a decision to engage, even if it means by yourself. By yourself, if need be. That was my case um, when I began the journey of the White King. Just a little background that I'm not certain and all of you know, actually. Um, that uh, 2001, of course, we remember 9-11. By 2004, I recognized that something was missing. And I do have a talent for spotting the omitted. So I just started to look at it. And I realized that I was going to need to write the first book. And then that ultimately led to four because others were missing it as well. 
very prominent people, leaders, people in positions of power and authority and influence and good people trying to do a great job. Well, they were missing it as well. So I was alone up here in Montana at my ranch in another part of the state where I was living at the time. And I just chose to engage. I spotted what I spotted and I chose to engage and I was all alone. I had never written a novel. I had never written in this arena, anything like this. I had no connections. I had no support, no help, but I started. And that has led to here actually four novels later, a series that has proved prescient and the launch of the Clearview. And you see, I know that each of you, many of you are operating in your own arenas and you're gifted in those arenas and you're committed in those arenas. And uh, nothing that I will ever say or do here would be to take you away from what you're working on, quite the opposite. I'm hoping to empower and kind of give you some support up there and maybe elevate the view. So you're gonna be in your arena and probably filtering this through that as well. But here in this one spot, we are all together. And that's why I launched the Clearview. And again, I'd never done anything like this either. So um, if you'll remember though, at the end of the uh, fourth part, Simple Truths, Simple Tools, Simple Solutions, I promised that I was going to start at this point in the Clearview to start bringing on guests um, who embody engagement, commitment, and results. I don't think any of us has time the dire situations in, the, in our country today to be putting in a lot of time and money and energy or whatever and not get results. So um, I'm going to be looking for, and that's the criteria for the guests, that they're engaged, committed, and have results. And our inaugural guest who is with us tonight is just such a man. And um, he, and we'll get into interview with him in a little bit, but uh, he himself, spotted something that was missing that is so very, very vital for veterans, and he decided to engage. But I want to tell you a little bit about him before I bring him up, and then he'll probably fill some other things in as he goes, but he's an experienced CEO with a demonstrated history of working on a collaborative basis with like-minded organizations to accomplish mutually aligned goals. See, that's who we all are. We're working in different arenas. But we have mutually aligned goals, meaning we want the same thing for our country, for our families, for our communities, for our churches. We have mutually aligned goals. But if we can work on a collaborative basis, there's power in numbers and there's power in unity there. So just as in White King and the Seat at the Table and Operation Stone Age Viral, where Reagan and Alicia start to form up a way to reach and coordinate like-minded organizations and groups that were fighting back so effectively, um, it was designed to share insights, resources, information, just plain support, sometimes just knowing that you're with other people who are out in the fight, that each night when they look up at the moon, no matter where they are in this country, we're all looking at the same moon. And if you're out there late at night or working, and sometimes it seems harder than others, just look up at the moon and know that there are many, many great people. Uh, that are involved in that. And John is one of these. Now, he's recently been interviewed by John Bachman on Newsmax. Many of you may watch uh, them and some of the shows on that network. And I also saw him on NTV TV, which is uh, Epic uh, News. Um, uh, so the Epic Times and their news division has some television as well. And that interview, if I remember, occurred at CPAC. So he's back from that. But he is president and CEO of Veterans Strategic Solutions. And we care. You and I care about veterans. There are people on this broadcast watching me today who you yourselves are veterans, or you have family members who are or were veterans. You have maybe friends and colleagues. And there's information that John has for us that I think is so important for all of us and for all of them. So let's bring up and welcome John Spagnola. Hi, Hi there. Hi. So good to, good to have you with us. Thanks so much. Thanks for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Well, you're welcome. And we're going to have a fun time talking here because we, we have a few minutes to share some thoughts. And um, we do want to hear about your latest project that I was kind of alluding to there. But first, 
I want to delve into a little bit to enlighten the audience here what Veteran Strategic Solutions is. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, uh, I formed that organization. I, I've been very interested in veterans and their plight. As you know, we wouldn't be here as a country. We, you wouldn't have your show and we wouldn't have our freedoms if it weren't for veterans. And when I kept hearing over many years about the rates of suicide, I found was so unacceptable and the health conditions and what have you, I decided to look into it further and further. And the more I looked, the more I was coming across information that I wanted to understand more. And I looked at the fact of how can I really figure out the foundation of what might be at the foundation of the suicides or their health matters, and what can we do to improve that? And Excellent. One, yeah, one of the things I came up with was a whole understanding that they, they being the veterans, need all the information uh, that they're entitled to, and that's actually a requisite, um, so they can make a sane, informed decision about treatments that they would like to engage in or they're being told by their doctors to engage in. Um, specifically, it was the, uh, what they call black box medications that came up as a concern, because as you may know, those are the most risky medications um, that the FDA has put an actual black box around. That's why they call it a black box medication. They put that on the label and you'll see uh, this box around it. And it means it is the most risky uh, medications. It includes classifications like antidepressants, uh, neuroleptics, also known as antipsychotics, uh, narcotics, stimulants, anxiolytics. Um, and so it's, it's the ones that you have to be most cautious about. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll be continuing with that. But yeah. as I had mentioned to my audience before I brought you up, that you were you saw situations that's down the road when there's consequences and people are suffering. Right. And from what you describe, you were looking backwards to find out what's underneath that. What was there? Remember, I was talking about what's omitted. It was there, yeah. folks. It just wasn't part of the public discourse in the way that it was needed. Is that a fair way to evaluate what you just said? Yeah, that's very accurate. Okay. Well, in, in continuing on about the VSS, because you formed that. Now, were you by yourself when you did this, or did you have a big staff already and a whole group of people? No, no, just like you kind of outlined originally. It was like, a, you know, a Robin Hood sort of career where I decided I just needed to do something, get involved, and then I, you know, got some people to join and to help, of course. Um, but my biggest assistance has been that I work in conjunction with the large veteran service organizations like the American Legion, the VFW, the yeah. Association of the Navy, and a, a slew of you know heavy hitters that have a heart of gold and, and that really care and they've really duplicated uh, some of the uh, findings that I've come up with and uh, join shoulder to shoulder so that we could uh, maybe make some needed changes. Cool. And we will come into that and spend a little more time on that as we go. Now, with the organization itself, now that you've set it up, and by the way, I hope you caught note of that. Just by himself, just knew it was important, <laughs> had to do it and engaged. And that's the power of one. But um, what are some of the areas of focus for veteran strategic solutions? Because this will be first time for many people that they're hearing. What are some of the areas you work on? I know the medications, obviously, and suicides. Yeah, well, the focus actually is the health of veterans. And and that led me to look and, and learn about the suicides because they kind of go hand in hand. Uh, but that's really, that's a major area. Um, you know, it's been 10 to 20 years since the, the suicide statistics haven't really changed. And there's been an, an upsurge of billions and billions of dollars put into the VA with the whole prospect that the suicide uh, range or amounts would change, and they haven't. And they haven't. Uh, are you? Uh, do you know the current number of uh, veterans committing suicide per day? Well, you know, different sources will give you slightly different numbers, 
But yeah. typically, they're saying the recent uh, report by the VA came out about 17.5. Uh, average is around 20 is what you normally will hear a day, which yeah. is about 6,000 veterans that make it through battle, make it through war, come home and take their own lives. And you talk about non sequitur. And yes. Ridiculous. You know? Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And I think there may be some people that they go, did he just say 20? per day yes but and it's it's the contradiction of that these are brave men and women they've been through the fight they're well trained they've been through tough stuff mm -hmm. and they're strong and here they come home and something happens that caused them to leave altogether and see so that prompted you and overall help too because i know about four or five years ago was the first time we really started veterans had been complaining but we first time we started to hear about it in the public of the health and the service and lack of service at the VA. And it's easy with the prescriptions. All right, so that's a little bit on um, the VSS and the, the website there is veteransstrategicsolutions.com. And by the way, John, when, we, when this goes live on April 1st, uh, we will put that up there so people can go and you can um, point them when we get to the end on anything else. But tell us what you're working on now that sprung from all this that you started. Okay, well, um, let me just begin that by saying my journey began with a study of the Veteran Health Administration Handbook, and that's the rules and regulations that pertain to informed consent. Because I had noticed as I was speaking with veteran after veteran, veteran organization after veteran organization, that almost everyone I spoke to told me they didn't feel they had sufficient amount of information about the medications they were prescribed. They didn't know that suicide, for instance, suicide ideation, is the first side effect on all the classifications that I mentioned earlier. Um, also, depression, anxiety that you hear about all the time, hallucinations, homicides, these are all side effects that people are unaware of. And the veterans, of course, need to know what the potential side effects are in case they confront or come across these manifestations, they might think they're broken instead right. of, hey, this might be manifesting from the medications. And that right. might give them the added time to take to not take drastic action, but to actually get some consultation. And that's the key, I think, and in, in helping save veteran lives. Understood. And now the informed consent, so if, if I understood you correctly, that's in their handbook. It's supposed to be. But has it been done uh, verbally as compared to written? Is that what's been happening or not you, at all? You, no, you hit it on the head. It is mandated. And I, I find the handbook well written. Um, I think it's very well written. However, as you pointed out, it's verbal informed consent. And one has to ask themselves, how does one monitor verbal consent? How does one enforce verbal consent? There's really no way. Actually, one can say, does, are any veterans fully informed you know, about what they're taking in terms of the side effects? Additionally, veterans, it's also mandated they know that the treatment options that are available to them. And again, um, when I speak to veterans, they had no idea, most of them had no idea they have treatment options. Right, that it isn't just all take a pill. And right. yeah, that they had options. Well, that's pretty important in there, but also um, the verbal, because there's so many arbitraries that would be in there. First of all, even if the doctor intended to give them the information so they could decide if they wanted to take something that was dangerous and had a black box warning or not. When, you, when I'm just thinking with that, um, you don't know what the doctor holds as important or significant. You don't know what he feels is warranted or not warranted, or whether he even agrees with the black box warning, or whether he doesn't no, even himself, alternatives to offer to the patient. Yeah, that, that's an excellent point. Plus, a doctor is overwhelmed with patients. You hear it all the time. So that, so that it's easy for them to forget or to say, listen, next patient, and maybe miss the fact that they should be providing all that information of 
full informed consent of the veteran. And so the written form, see, would be a reminder to the doctor that he needs the veteran to sign that form. And that form is pretty simple. It just says, I, being a veteran, have been told of the side effects of these medications and that, in fact, I have treatment options such as chiropractic, acupuncture, canine therapy, hyperbaric therapy. There's a long list that they should be uh, you know, apprised of. And many of them would be available at their VA. Right. Are those, is that list uh, available and the doctors do have it, or does that list need to be created for our? You know, it, it, I think it needs to be created. I think all this really is a, a, I think it's important to put in writing, as I was mentioning, so the veteran can take a copy of it home with him, share it with his or her spouse and family members, because it's a team activity. Yeah. And when, in fact, you know, they all can understand what they're up against and what the potential effects or side effects are, they're going to be that much more able to protect and be enlightened, you know, in terms of potential side effects that might emerge. Exactly. Exactly. Now, what's it going to take in, uh, in your evaluation? I know because you're working on a project. Sure. What's it going to take for that to actually get implemented as written form consent? Is well, that no, that's a that's an excellent question. Uh, let me start off by saying that in well, let me say the GAO. I worked with a congressman back in 2019 on a GAO, a government accountability study. That group only does investigations for Congress, and I worked with them. And you know what the results? One of the results were that wow. they had that the VA has no evidence that any veteran was in fact told any treatment options. Wow. So that's already been studied and that was the result. After that, um, the GAO did another report and it said they think that opioids should have written informed consent, right? Shortly after that, uh, one of the director, the director at the time of the VA, David Shulkin, he's a medical doctor, mandated that all long-term pain opioids have written informed consent. See, so it can be done, just to answer your question, it could be done administratively by someone like the VA secretary, which he did. However, if it's not a law, when another administration comes in, he could reverse it. Got it. And right. so that's why we are now pursuing the legislative path. Okay. Well, tell us a little bit about that, of what, what you've been working on and what's happened with that. Well, the first thing I did was I uh, talked to my brothers and sisters in the, in the veterans organizations and uh, about the issue. And as of now, I have 12 veteran organizations, including the two largest, the American Legion and VFW, but also including Vietnam veterans, Jewish war veterans, uh, the, the uh, Reserve Officers Association of America. Uh, you know, I have special operations groups that are supporting us, many, many of fleet reserves, and even the Association of the U.S. Navy. So these are, these are in fact, the uh, people who are uh, supporting our, organ our group right now and in in my activities, which is really pretty amazing because they're very powerful. And what they did in talking to them, what some of them did was they went to their national bodies and they passed resolutions individually to on written informed consent. So it became their policy. And in fact, which was the best thing, I think, because no matter what happens to me or my efforts, if it's their policy, then the issue will continue. And to me, that's the most important thing. Right, exactly. It's that we can start things. And I want all of you to, who are listening and watching to really understand that, that you may see something, you know something needs to be done, you can choose to engage, maybe you will engage with an existing organization, maybe you'll help them, maybe you'll start your own project, or maybe you'll just start communicating. But it's when you start to attract those like-minded organizations who have a common mission and a common passion, if you will, for it, that it goes way beyond you. And now in order to move it to legislation, that's what you're currently working on, right? 
That's right. Yeah, we have a draft bill right now that all those 12 organizations support, and it will basically implement written informed consent for black box medic medications, the five classifications that I already mentioned. Um, and that if that's put into effect, which we hope it will be, I believe that it will impact not only veteran suicides, but also polypharmacy, which is another very serious matter in the VA. I mean, I, I was speaking with the CEO of the Navy SEAL Foundation, and she told me she has one veteran on 40 medications at once. Oh, my Lord. Yeah. Oh, which, my Lord. That's, that's death. <laughs> well, you you know, it starts to explain a lot, doesn't it? Yes, um, it does. And also it explains a bit about suicide. I, I mean, overdoses as well, which is another major situation. Uh, now, I'm not saying the medications are bad because sometimes medications are needed and appropriate. But we have to be fully informed about the medications so we can take the proper actions to protect ourselves. And, and I, I just want to give you a quick example. If you're a veteran and you're sitting out there and suddenly you know, you, you were on one of these medications and you experience hallucinations. You might think, oh my God, I'm broken. I'm worthless. I, I'm going to be a problem to my wife, to my employer, and to mankind. Why am I going to stick around? See, however, if you were told by the doctor with a form that hallucinations could occur, you might think twice and say, you know, I need to check with my doctor first be before I take any potential drastic actions to make sure it's not me. And maybe it's something else like the medication. Yeah. And before they beat themselves up psychologically as well, as well. because as you say, these are warriors who are yes. now home and that's got to have an impact when you were strong and able and resilient and all of a sudden things are happening. Um, yeah. Very um, interesting material there. Now, um, have you you got support from the organizations? How is it going with legislatures? And uh, are you yeah. at state level or federal or what? Yeah, I'm working. I'm working solely in the federal level, and um, I have a congressman now who found out about my work, and he wrote and said they want to champion uh, the draft bill, which is very exciting. Right. Um, and so at this point, the next step is for the congressmen to get the what they call original co-sponsors that will join him when he introduces the bill. Right. Right. And so he is seeking members of the subcommittee and, you know, other influential members to join him. And then we'll uh, offer up all congressmen to come on the bill as well. So that's the next steps. Yeah, well, that will certainly be interesting because everyone, you see, doesn't matter the party, everyone once they realize what has developed there and what's been missed and that it's a simple thing it's it's a simple thing to just really have it be a written form as compared yeah. to verbal you would think you would get a lot of coalescing there hopefully you would think so you, you know i did get some pushback believe it or not from uh, one of the committees and their their pushback was you know this might be too much administrative burden on the system and I, I I don't even know how to respond to that. When you're talking veterans' lives, this is not right. about doctor's uh, pressure or, or, you know, conveniences or not or workload. This is about saving veterans' lives. And there really is nothing more important. And um, it, it's really offensive when I'm told something like it's an administrative burden. So yeah. that's not going to stop us, as you probably have guessed. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I mean, they had no problem whatsoever just in the overall medical field uh, requiring doctors to do a um, quite a survey on us. If you go visit your doctor for your annual physical, they right. have like 100 questions that they ask you in there to kind of check to see how you're doing in all these arenas. And that's administratively interesting. This is simply a form that would be introduced and the doctor would have it and they're working on laptops. It would be right there for them to um print off. I mean, so, so simple. Yeah. It is yeah, offensive and, when they do that. It, and additionally, it's already mandated that the veteran yeah. knows the side effects and is, in other words, inform, is informed of the side effects and is informed of the treatment options. That's already mandated. It's not in question. We're not coming up. We're not creating this new idea. We're just yeah. saying, let's make sure 
you know, it, there's accountability and that this yes. is being monitored. That's the exactly. only good thing. Yeah. Now, by the way, yeah, there was a term you use, polypharmacies. Yes. Is that meaning that the vet's getting prescriptions and filling them at one pharmacy and then there are other meds prescribed and they're at another pharmacy or what? Well, polypharmacy in itself is just basically what it says, and that is more than one medication. And sometimes it's typical now to be on 5, 10, even 20, typically. Yeah, uh, sure. so that's And there's really almost no studies on that. We're really in effect, in, in a way, using veterans as guinea pigs, which is very upsetting to me that we, you know, we need, we need a lot more studies and into what's going on to protect these guys. So no, I mean, you're right. Uh, there's a lot of reports about veterans going outside of the VA and getting prescriptions and then inside the, the VA. And sometimes the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is right. doing. That's a concern, and it's another issue that has to get uh, more closely monitored. Well, all the more reason to have the form, uh, because yes. Yes. then in case they do seek help somewhere else, that form is traveling with them. And, you know, you were talking about multiple medications. For the first time in my life ever this past year, I had to have a medication and a second one. And so it was the first time that I have medications. And I'm a lot older than most people are when they start taking medications. But uh, we can't assume that if it's just verbally informed, that the patient is going to remember everything that he was told, even if he was told everything appropriately. Because exactly. I brought my, they sent me home with a packet and I had written very strict statements from the drug manufacturer about that medication and really what I could and couldn't do and shouldn't and shouldn't do and what this could happen and if I experienced this. And I kept that in a folder when I was traveling this winter. I couldn't trust myself to remember everything that was in there because it was quite a bit. And so I kept the folder with me and I would consult it so that in case I was experiencing something, I didn't assume there was something else wrong with me. It might in fact be a side effect. And so that's just me, citizen, dealing with something that requires some medication. And what you're talking about is the ones that are so very, very dangerous. Now, did you discover people that didn't know that it wasn't written in form, that it was not there in written form? Uh, you know, continuously, uh, one, of, one of the ones that comes to my mind is a two-star general, uh, Jeff Phillips, that's uh, executive director of uh, Reserve Offices uh, Association, also known as the Reserve Organization of America. And yep. um, we had breakfast and I told him about the issue and my concern about veterans. And he looked at me and he says, John, you mean that the veterans don't have to sign a form at this time to get these kinds of strong medications and get the side effects and treatment options? And I said, no. And he goes, well, why not? That's, that's ridiculous. So he went ahead and passed his own resolution supporting this for veterans then he went ahead and passed one for armed services, which is the active military who also have an yes. unacceptably high suicide rate as well. Yes, understood. Uh, yeah. Well, that's why I wanted to, you know, get into this today and bring it to the people because there may be people watching that go, I had no idea. And they may have somebody in their family that's struggling and they know they're on medication, but now they know what questions to ask exactly. and where to go and uh, what should be there. Now, how can the people who are watching my on my website, how can they help you or what can they do to help advance this legislation so that this simple thing that's supposed to be there actually is there? What can the people do? Well, the, the name of the draft bill is the Written Informed Consent Act. So they can keep an eye out for that. Um, they can also continue watching you because you could relate to them when it's introduced uh, okay. as, as another avenue, you know, uh, of them being alerted. Uh, so that would be a couple of things. But, yeah, they can check with, you know, on the Internet for that legislation to see when it will be introduced. It should be yeah. fairly soon. Good. And a lot of people do got checked to know what bills are pending, but they maybe don't. And it is a federal bill. And I will do that when I know that it has been introduced. Mm -hmm. I will make that week's commentary about that so that it's up and posted in a fairly quick amount of time. And, you know, I'll be ending off today with some information for the people because uh, now. 
because even if you don't aren't a vet or don't have a veteran that you know, which would be unusual in today's society, um, folks, um, it's important to weigh in because even if their congressperson is not on that committee, that bill is going before Congress. And so they should communicate in the ways that they normally do, whether it's phone call, mm -hmm. email, or whatever. Because the more congressmen who are aware that they're getting input, by the way, folks, and feedback on a bill that's coming up that they might not otherwise pay attention to, because mm -hmm. uh, they're all distracted with the other razzle-dazzle stuff, um, if they're getting feedback, from you, that this is one you have very in, deep interest in and concern for and you want to see passed, doesn't that help as well? Yeah, very much so. A grassroots is really what moves congressmen to make the correct decisions or incorrect, depending on who's, who's lobbying them. So uh, if your audience is of the mindset to either email, fax, or uh, a call, which I always find is the best and most effective, uh, the local congressman and just said, listen, there's a bill that's going to be introduced called the Written Informed Consent Act. Would you please support it, find out about it, and they could provide my Veteran Strategic Solutions website. Um, and, you know, they could help just by getting the word out and telling others that they know that we need to move on and support this whole concept of consent, written consent. Yeah, well, I will do that. As a matter of fact, tomorrow I'm going to be at a meeting here because Montana has a very small population. It's a huge state, but mm -hmm. there's not very many people here. So we now have two Congress people. But my congressperson is Ryan Zinke. And he was under Trump. He was the one of the first, I think, uh, secretaries of interior. Mm -hmm. But then he ran for Congress and he did win. So he is my congressman and they're doing a meet and greet, you know, as we're in election season now, sure. right here in town. So I'm going to that. And I do, I will bring that up to him. And uh, I, because it might even surprise him. He is a command. He was a Navy SEAL commander. His credentials are high, but I don't know if he knows that, you know, you know, that, he, that's what I'm not making any assumptions that anybody knows anything. He probably doesn't. And, and so you, you'll probably be bringing uh, and, and shedding light on the real important issue that I bet you, once he learns about it, he'll probably want to be on board. That's what I would yep. guess. And you mentioned Montana. I had a meeting with uh, Senator Tester, by the way, uh, and told him about this whole concept. And he was surprised, and they were looking into it right now. So hopefully, they'll come. it'd be great if uh, all your friends and allies could let him know that, you know, they'd like him to support it as well. He's yes. going to have to get it introduced in the Senate. Yes, right. Uh, it'll start in the House. Will yeah. it? And then move to the Senate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, but the, what's hard, and I know a lot of my audience is probably already saying they cannot imagine anybody not voting for this unless they themselves are happy with a statistic that's high and flat mm -hmm. uh, of deaths of people that deserve so much better uh, from us and for us. And um, has been very enlightening, and I, as he's mentioned his website a couple of times, and you can reach me, and I and I can get the questions over to John as well. And before we um, start wrapping up here, I have just a slightly different question here, sure. um, because uh, again, I want people to understand that no matter what we're doing in our lives and what areas you carry the most importance for us or the priorities that this is a time when we have to do more, <laughs> and we have to be willing to face things and. Uh, deal with them, uh, even if we're not comfortable with it, or we've never done anything like that, or we don't know where to begin. So I just want to ask you, as I haven't asked you this before, did you start out in life to do this, or were you doing something altogether <laughs> different? <laughs> no, I was doing many, many things that were quite different, very off track, and I've got myself on a just an excellent path. I love this. It's my passion. You know, I, I do this just because I, I just love the work, and I know how important it is. And you know, when a person has what I call a purpose or a passion, that makes life worthwhile. And, um, you know, as you do, I mean, here you are enlightening people, writing brilliant pieces, you know, doing the major research that you do continuously. I don't know how you do it all, but I'm so glad that you do. And you fit time in for something like this issue. And I really, really appreciate that. And I bet your audience does as well. Right. I, I, I thank you for that. And I know they will, because I don't think that the patriots that would be on my site 
uh, would be unaware of what you started with, is that we wouldn't even have the freedom to do what we're doing or live the lifestyle or have our barbecues as we come into summer or right. boat on the lakes in the summer if it were not for the men and women who went into harm's way for us. And they deserve the best from us, not the worst. And I know we haven't talked about the homelessness, but that's another area. And uh, But the overall health. Uh, because if once they've left the service, if they can be healthy and happy as they come home, even if they come home with some of the um, injuries that they have suffered, mm -hmm. they would know that we're behind them. And so I expect that all of my audience would be 100% on board, but that they've probably been a little bit surprised um, knowing that there's that vulnerability there. And uh, the idea that people might be on 10 medications, and these are typically younger or more fit. I realize some of them might be older veterans, but um, it's just, we have to look at that. And you put your thumb on it though, in, in, a finger on it along the way as well, that a lot of it can be unintentional. That's why it does need to be legislatively put in place because the doctors are overworked and it's very easy for them to just verbally recommend one thing rather than learn about the other things or build their own list of options mm -hmm. or at least one website. Is there one website, by the way, that if a vet were to say to you, okay, I now understand, I understand the black box and I understand I have a better feeling for what I've been experiencing with the meds, but you talked about alternatives and John, is there a place where I can go to learn about some of the alternatives? Do you happen to have a site they could go to or an organization? You know, what, what I would do is if someone was willing to write me, I would do the research and get them that information. And so save them the, the, the time and effort because there's a lot of different, actually, I, I had a bill that I helped write uh, years ago that passed that developed complementary medicine modalities uh, that are in place now. And so, you know, th that's so needed and, and so important. Um, I don't know of a website that encompasses them all. Obviously, you could um, go in a browser and put in complementary medicine for veterans, and you'll get a good list probably just with that. Yeah, okay. That's excellent. And, and folks, if you want to reach him, um, I, when we post this, we'll have his website, and there's a contact section on your website, is there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. And the same with me. You can always reach me and say, hey, I want to connect up with John because I want to help him with that legislation or I want to uh, help him or bring him in to speak to some people because, you know, um, there's no community that isn't impacted by this. You take even high schoolers. Um, mm -hmm. They're in the schools, but they have siblings or aunts and uncles or parents who are vets and they know some of the situations and for them to be informed. And that's the key thing. What we're informed of brings into view something that wasn't visible. It was there. It just wasn't visible. Right. And once it's brought into light, good, fair-minded, committed citizens usually figure out what to do and what is right. They just have to have some of the cover up moved off or clouds or just things slip through the crack or somebody didn't view it as important. And uh, so I appreciate what you shared with us today very much in coming on and the way in which you can probably tell how effective you would be with legislators because um, John doesn't have a political ax to grind. He's trying to help, absolutely help veterans and uh, have them be healthy. And this is an arena, you can tell the passion there. And I appreciate that. Well, I'm gonna let you take your camera off uh, I'm going to wrap up with some things that I need to to wrap this up and kind of put a little bow around it and uh, introduce the next topic. So once again, so good to see you. You can tell I was giving you a thumbs up along the way there on some things. And uh, you can stay with us and listen. I'll just have you take your camera and your sound off. And thank you again for your time and, and wonderful questions. I really appreciate you. You're most welcome. You're most All welcome. Right. All right. Well, I'm going to wrap up. I hope you really, really enjoyed that. And that's the type of thing we're going to be bringing to you because, and if you're one of those people that you feel that you want to have a message or something that you're working on enhanced, feel free to communicate because we're at that stage. Now, however, there is something that I want to appeal to you for and some help I need with this. I really know that many of you are experiencing and enjoying the content on this site. And I encourage you to bring friends and family 
to this subscription web, uh, website. Now, it's, it costs less than one cup of coffee per week to subscribe to this website. But this material actually does need to be behind a protected wall. And if you've been through the site and watched some of my webcasts, heard some of the podcasts, you know that that's the type of commentary that is unique. And so it is unique content. This isn't just an ordinary uh, newscast or webcast. Uh, it's not another news site. It's not another commentary or analysis site that you're used to. Because I deployed here, and it's one of the first webcasts I did, the peak to peak principle is what I call it. And uh, you can watch that for free on the home page of the website by way. As you scroll down, there's like free webcasts to watch. That's the one where I taught everybody about the peak to peak principle. And it is, if you're a climber or a hiker, you'll know what it is, but it is what we're gradually doing here to get people to a point where they can see what they need to see and get a view from the summit. Because with my training, both in marketing and in business um, and in uh, studying the human mind, but also in the acting, when you change the angle of view, a new and different picture emerges. And if you want to stop Americans from being locked in like this, start to get it to loosen up where we can communicate and we can find a common enemy. Now, I'm not saying there's an enemy there with the absence of this information, but a common problem, a common issue to be attacked. We can unite and work on it together. And it, cha it takes changing the angle of view and very often the elevation of view. This site is the only one I'm aware of where every single week I am coming in on a topic or every month with the webcast where it may be something you're aware of and is on your radar screen or you've been fighting it or working at it and you're banging your head against the wall. I am coming in from a different angle and a different elevation in order to help you see that. Now, that was my directing training and that was my acting training. But we're all engaged in various activities. I call it the whack-a-mole game. And it's a game, by the way, set up by an enemy and controlled by an enemy. That's another topic, and that is on the website. But we are hitting in all of our arenas. And But if you can see the game from a higher elevation, you can see how to prioritize your counterattack lines, if you will, your approaches to solutions and whatnot. And so there's a view from the summit. And I promise you that when you switch the angle of view, maybe 90 degrees, best is 180 and you come through the point of view of your opponent or the obstacles or the viewpoints or the fixed ideas you come through that viewpoint you'll see a lot but when we're in the midst of a situation or an area that we're working in we're in it if I can get you up above and your friends and family above it and at a different angle you're looking at the same facts you're looking at the same cast of characters you're looking at the same people the same scenarios but you're looking at it from a different angle. And when you connect the dots, a different picture emerges and so do solutions. That is the entire underlying story of the White King series. I simply made my initial approach and I took a different angle of view, came through the point of view of the enemy. And I was looking at the same things that we were all looking at, the same newspaper headlines, the same issues. But the change of angle of view, which my readers get because they're traveling in the novel and in the story, that view opens up insight and it opens up solutions. And so uh, I need your help in bringing people here. And they will discover, just as many of you have, that this isn't like any other place, but it does need to be behind a protected wall there. Now, uh, my hope, my intention is to provide clarity with every web, with every commentary the podcasts are linked weekly to the commentary. So what if you've noticed the format, I'll have a written commentary for you. And then I go to an audio podcast. So if you're washing dishes in the morning or driving to work, you can listen to it. It's only once a month that we do this. And this is the important stuff. But the intention of this website is to provide clarity. You're all super smart people. You're dedicated, committed people. I'm trying to just help provide greater clarity, definitely to offer hope and awareness that will inspire you and empower you to act. And you may already be engaged. And you may be saying, Lee, I already am. True. But not everybody you know is. And this site is one that's digestible because they're not going to be slapped in the face with political opinions and a lot of emotion. It's a very sane and rational site. So if you haven't read the entire White King series from 
uh, all four of them from beginning to end. You need to do that. If you've read it in the past, start again, because we are living in, an al in that allegory. The novels are modern day allegories and we are living the story at this moment. I was writing in advance of the story, but we are living it. And um, no matter how aware you are and awake you are, taking this one step at a time, one book at a time, will bring you on the journey and it takes you to the summit. It absolutely takes you to the summit of the mountain. But it will take friends and family there as well. So if they're not interested in podcasts, have them get into the books because we learn through stories. Man's history has always been told through stories. Now, um, I do want to tell you that we have made more commentary free for you so that when you log in now and you go to the commentary section, you're going to see a lot of commentary there that is free. You can copy those links and send them out to your email list and get them out into your sphere of influence. Some are on the available on the homepage where when they go there to watch video and look at what the site offers, there's free commentary there that was readers favorites. Uh, but there's a lot more content that we have made free. So I do encourage you to take advantage of that because you see, I can only do so much. Just like John could only do so much, but he's moved far enough now and he has enough support an agreement that has come in to the organizations that he has talked to and the patient determined work that he has done that now a bill will be before Congress and we can make this happen. Well, I can only do so much. I have my wheelhouse. I'm proud of that wheelhouse, but it's in alignment with you and your word of mouth that will be the most effective because something, I have a marketing background. So let me just share a little something with you because sometimes people are a little shy about doing that or they're a little proprietary about their sphere of influence. In marketing, your credibility and your word of mouth endorsement will always be worth more than any advertisement, any other stuff that's going on, any cool stuff, any mass mailings, any mass emails. It is your personal endorsement with people that are either working with you or part of your organizations or you're part of theirs that provides enough credibility that when they examine on their own, they can then go into agreement with it. And that starts the duplication because I think you all have communicated with me over the last um, eight months with this site, but prior to that with Operation Stone Age Viral, we've got to go a whole lot farther, a lot faster than we are. We're on the right path, but we've got to go a lot faster. And what that takes is what Reagan and Alicia in the novel did, and what John is a specialist at as he's throughout his life and what he's talked about, and you read more about that, he helps with collaborative efforts because here how that here's how that works. When you start moving this material into your communities, we start to get a duplication. It rolls out. You, you have a certain group that I don't have. And they then in turn know other people that they will reach that you wouldn't know to reach. So there's a duplication process. What it is, is an ever expanding agreement on the concepts or the ideas or the projects. That's what he's been working on with his. There's been an ever expanding agreement on the need for what was supposed to be there anyway, written, informed consent. Making it legislatively done means that it can't be changed or forgotten and whatnot, and it can always be brought back and can be monitored. And it can be enforced because you can see if the document was handed over and it was signed. So that's in John's arena. But an ever-expanding agreement uh, is created by an ever-expanding communication. So if you will bring people here, I promise you, that I will deliver to you content that they go, wow, uh, I, I didn't see that before. I, I just never looked at it that way. I promise you that. I promise you that. But when you bring them there and then you start communicating and then they start communicating, it's ever expanding communication. And they're on the same issues, like-minded people who are only communicating in the first place because they are like-minded. And that's the affinity thing. So your ever-expanding communication brings about ever-expanding agreement. And through that, there's an ever-expanding like-mindedness and a liking. And so even people who might have been at odds on certain issues, they loosen up because they like this and they're in communication. And they find they are like-minded on a common target for a common goal. 
that brings about understanding and that brings about the solutions we need faster. None of us can do this alone. None of our individual organizations can do it alone. If you've been following me, you know we are under attack in every direction. So I can do my part. It's a very high level part. And I'm not bragging and I'm not patting myself on the back. Frankly, I wish I'd been wrong on everything I've ever had to write about in the novels, everything I've been communicating. But I haven't been wrong. And you haven't been wrong. And just like John said, we don't want the veteran to feel that he's wrong or he's broken because something was not there for him. So my friends, I hope you have enjoyed this session. I have, I thank John again. So that's John Spagnola and it's veteransstrategicsolutions.com. And I look forward to get into all the March content. And if you didn't watch all four of those webcasts, starting with my January story, do that. And then I, uh, this will launch on April 1st and will be available. And as I promised, uh, John will make me aware when that bill does go forward. And I will do an immediate commentary and we will immediately make it free so that you can get it out and we will bring it out from behind the wall. And my friends, as I say goodbye to Yalga, I'll see you in May or you'll see me in May and you'll hear from me before then. So we'll say goodnight. <laughs>